Britain was almost constantly at war against the French Revolution and against Napoleon from 1793 to 1815. It emerged victorious, not least because of its growing industrial and commercial power. During the war, however, many British Conservatives venerated the old way of life that was passing away. The life of hierarchy, honour, faith and personal loyalty rather than the new commercial urban life that was beginning to take its place. Romantic conservatism helped to shape the mood of Victorian Britain and to temper some of its utilitarian harshness. In the late 1820s and early 1830s, Britain repealed its anti-Catholic laws and reformed an undemocratic, unrepresentational parliamentary system. Conservatives opposed both changes. They opposed Catholic emancipation because they thought that the unity of church and state was the bulwark of British political stability. And because for nearly three centuries, Catholicism had carried overtones of sympathy for Britain's enemies, Spain and France. They opposed the Reform Act because they foresaw that it would shift political power away from the landed gentry, their source of greatest strength, and towards the new middle classes. Their great strength lay in the House of Lords, which repeatedly vetoed the Reform Act. When the Whig Prime Minister, Lord Grey, directed King William IV to begin appointing new pro-reform lords until they outnumbered the old ones, the Upper House finally relented and the reform became law. Despite the Conservatives' passionate opposition to the Reform Act, their descendants would look back fondly to it as evidence that Britain, unlike France, could reform itself procedurally and without violence. In that sense, the Reform Act served the same function in Britain as the election of 1800 had served in America. While influential writers in the early 19th century created a mood of romantic conservatism and it affected English literature and politics throughout the Victorian era. No names more important in this process than that of Walter Scott. He was the most popular novelist in England uh, in the 1810s and 20s, up until the uh, time that Dickens became famous. And in a succession of wildly popular novels, he evoked a lost world of chivalry and honour. To read Walter Scott is to enter a world of swashbuckling knights in armour, rescuing damsels in di distress from ravishment people with deep personal loyalties, and there's a constant evocation by Scott of a world which was already archaic by his day. The historian Frank O'Gorman comments uh, about Scott. He says, in novels such as Ivanhoe and The Talisman, Scott touched the very powerful medieval chords of his reading public. In others, such as Red Gauntlet and Waverley, Scott depicted the recent, Hitler, the, the recent history of Scotland in a compelling and patriotic manner. In all his novels, Scott embellishes the themes of loyalty to monarchs, conformity to institutions, their rules and rituals, acceptance of hierarchy and the social system. Scott idealises history, recognising the sources of social order in the veneration of antiquity and the springs of patriotism in the preservation of the national institutions. Of social progress, popular rights and economic progress, nothing is heard at all. Well, Walter Scott was very popular, uh, not only in Britain, but also in the American South. And in fact, Mark Twain once uh, joked that Walter Scott was the chief cause of the American Civil War because so many Southern gentlemen picked up from Scott the, these um, pseudo-medieval ideas and fought for them. They were too willing to resort to arms on the battlefields of Virginia. When Walter Scott wrote on questions of politics, he said that it was only right that the property, it was right that only the property owners should vote, because only they had the proper independence and sufficient education. They were the best able, said Scott, to take care of the needs of the population as a whole. Another influential Romantic conservative was the poet William Wordsworth. Now, as a very young man, Wordsworth had been excited by the outbreak of the French Revolution, which he commemorates in his long poem, The Prelude. But as he grew older, he turned away from France, particularly uh, as the revolution had become more radical and more violent. And in his later work, he uh, contemplated the beauty and stability of England. And that's characteristic of much of his later work.
Wordsworth was a very close friend of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The two of them are remembered as the Lake Poets because they lived in the English Lake District. And similarly, Coleridge eulogised the established forms of England, perhaps particularly the Church of England. Coleridge said that the Church of England, the established Church of England, brought to ordinary Englishmen the maxims of a pure morality and those sublime truths of the divine unity and attributes. And he went on to explain the, the, the vital role that the church played in every parish throughout the kingdom. He said that to every parish throughout the kingdom there is transplanted a germ of civilization, that in the remotest village there is a nucleus round which the capabilities of the place may crystallize and brighten, a model sufficiently superior to excite, yet sufficiently near to encourage and facilitate imitation. This unobtrusive, continuous agency of a Protestant church establishment, that this it is which the patriot and the philanthropist, who would fain unite the love of peace with faith in the progressive amelioration of mankind, cannot estimate at too high a price. Now I think it's important for us to remember when we're thinking about England in the very early 1800s, that this was still a world in which most people were illiterate, and in which the minister of the established church really did play a very important role. Very often the, the parson or the vicar would be by far the most educated man in the community. Sometimes he'd be one of the very few literate people in the parish, and so he'd be a link to the wider outside world. And in addition to taking care of the parishioners' spiritual welfare, he'd be the one who'd be able to inform them about what was happening elsewhere in England. Certainly it seemed entirely reasonable to many people in Wordsworth and Coleridge's generation, generation that the established church should re retain its central place. Another figure in the Romantic conservatism is William Cobbett. He deplored the decline of benign patriarchy in the English countryside. We met him earlier in this course as Peter Porcupine, a Federalist propagandist, because he'd visited the United States in the 1790s, expected to find a democratic utopia, and had been horrified by what he said was the degradation of public manners by the spread of democracy. Back in England, he developed a reputation as a, a, a Tory radical. He was critical of the authorities of his era, because they no longer took sufficient moral responsibility for the poor among them. Cobbett said it was deeply regrettable that the old economy of personal duty and personal responsibility on the part of the gentlemen and the aristocrats was gradually being displaced by a money economy in which everything was thought of in terms of its, of its uh, value in pounds, shillings and pence, that it was making men cold and heartless. And Cobbett said that this was most clearly seen in the harsh treatment of the poor, the increasingly harsh treatment of the poor, who used to be the special concern of the, of the patriarchal gentlemen. Well, one of the most important political movements of the 1820s was Catholic emancipation. That is, the uh, removal of obstacles to Catholics serving as members of parliament and magistrates and army officers. I mentioned earlier in the lecture on Pitt that King George III had refused to go along, he'd vetoed it back in 1801 because it said it would violate his oath of loyalty to uphold the principles of the Church of England. But Catholic emancipation finally did become law in 1829 despite energetic conservative resistance. The crucial figure in making it possible is Daniel O'Connell. He was an Irishman, a lawyer and a spellbinding orator who began a, a movement in the 1820s for Catholic emancipation. In 1823 he was the founding figure in a group called the Catholic Association and its members campaigned for the right of Catholics to sit in Parliament. This was the first necessary step towards his ultimate intention which was Irish home rule. Well, he, he, in, in America you run for a seat in Congress, but in Britain you stand for a seat in Parliament. I'm not quite sure what the difference is between running and standing. In any event, he stood for a seat in Parliament in 1828 and won, but was unable to take the seat because of his religion. And this situation placed the Prime Minister, the Duke of Wellington, in a very, very awkward situation. He knew that there would be uprising and bloodshed in Ireland if Parliament refused to let O'Connell, this wildly popular figure, take his seat in Parliament. But to, to, but to permit him to take his seat, 
would mean amending the law and ending nearly three centuries of Catholic exclusion. And it's almost impossible to exaggerate the way in which uh, fear and, 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 and dread of the Catholics had been integral to, to being British for so long, for all but a, a small minority. Now, the Duke of Wellington was the Prime Minister sitting in the House of Lords because he was a Duke, and Robert Peel was the, uh, the leader of the House of Commons, the lower house. Between them, they reluctantly introduced legislation, the Catholic Relief Act of 1829. They were Conservatives, and the Conservatives were the people who were particularly reluctant to do this. But they felt that not to do so was to uh, usher in dangerous social upheavals. Peel, about whom I'll say more in the next lecture, was the most gifted Conservative in the House of Commons. And he'd already given his name to the new Metropolitan Police Force, the Peelers, by legislation of 1828. The reason British policemen are sometimes still called Bobbies right up to the present is after his first name, Robert. Uh, so Peelers and Bobbies are policemen. And he was the inventor of the first urban police force. Now, Peel took the pragmatic view that it's better to make concessions than it is to face civil strife. This, in fact, has been a recurrent conservative dilemma throughout the last two and a half centuries. When are judicious concessions necessary, even when they sometimes fly in the face of the beliefs of your own supporters? And it was a problem that Peel had to face repeatedly. Many conservatives, the ultras, regarded Peel as a traitor to his party and to the national church, the man who was selling out Protestantism and, 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 as they saw it, dangerously empowering the Catholics. But in fact, the anti-democratic the anti Tories got a good bargain out of the Act because although it did uh, permit Catholics to take seats in Parliament, it also restricted the suffrage, that is the right to vote, to owners of property worth £10, where previously the property qualification had been just £2. So although the more prosperous Catholics could now participate, the Irish electorate actually shrank by the, uh, by the terms of the Act of Parliament. Peel's a very paradoxical figure, but there's no question that he's one of the great giants of conservative history in Britain. Listen to the historian Robert Blake commenting on him. He says, Peel was one of the greatest statesmen of his age. He was, a most, he was a most able administrator. He possessed a remarkable capacity for hard work. He was humane. He cared intensely about the distress and poverty of the society in which he lived. He had, till Disraeli broke it, an ascendancy in the House of Commons unequalled by any rival. He was very rich. He was most happily married. He achieved his ambition of becoming Prime Minister. Yet, there is something curiously uneasy about him. He lacked the gift of managing people. He did not bother to conciliate his supporters. And he was peppery, finding it difficult to suffer fools gladly or to make the effort to win over malcontents and rebels. He had an unfortunately egotistical manner and was even more addicted than most politicians to the first person singular. In other words, he was constantly using phrases beginning I, I this, I that. Well, if uh, Catholic emancipation was difficult, was, a, was a, a parliamentary crisis, even more so was the Great Reform Act of 1832. Conservatives were passionately reluctant to pass it. But in the end, they, they acquiesced. And this was the act which began the long, slow process of turning the British government into a parliamentary democracy. There were many conspicuous abuses in the British political system. One of them was that because of population shifts, the representation in Parliament did not in any way represent the distribution of the population uh, around the country. Many seats in Parliament were what were called rotten boroughs. These were places which had once been populated, but now were almost deserted, even though they still sometimes had two or even four members of Parliament. One famous case was the constituency of Old Sarum, which had two members of Parliament, and only seven voters. By contrast, the new industrial cities of Birmingham and Manchester, which had tens of thousands of voters, had no members of parliament at all. Another common abuse was pocket boroughs. These were usually towns, often with a very, very small electorate, in the more or less complete control of the local lord, 
who could merely nominate his own candidate without fear of contradiction. Very often the Lord would nominate his own son or a deferential associate to the seat in Parliament. They weren't really elected, they were really just appointed. And this was very widespread. 276 out of 489 English members of Parliament came from pocket boroughs. They didn't really have to go through the rigours of an election at all. The seats which did have more uh, more voters were the county seats, uh, those from, the, from the, the, uh, the English counties, and those from London. They were more democratic. But a wide variety of rules governed who could vote and why. The qualifications were different in each different constituency. And very often they, they harked back to particular royal charters or royal privileges which had been bestowed in the past. So there was a wide array of different rules governing the, uh, the electorate. As I mentioned in an earlier lecture, William Pitt had attempted to reform Parliament in 1785 and had failed. Once the French Revolution began and the Napoleonic Wars, he lost interest in parliamentary reform because the idea of giving more representation to the people seemed potentially dangerous. And in fact, it was under Pitt that repressive legislation was passed by Parliament against political activism by the lower classes. That was the characteristic of the Napoleonic era. And there were many principled objections to the idea of expanding the electorate. Uh, in 1810, for example, George Canning spoke against extending popular representation because of what he saw as the fickleness and ignorance of the electorate. In other words, said Canning, the more democracy you have, the more the likelihood of irresponsible and unnecessary conflicts Listen to a little bit of his speech against democratic reforms in 1810. First of all, he said, there's always the danger that uh, too much popular representation will lead us into unnecessary wars. As it is, even without direct representation, the people constantly are dragging Britain into war. He said, there has not been a war during a century which was not in its commencement strictly popular. The people it was who goaded the government and the house to hostility. The people it was who forced and goaded even the Pacific Sir Robert Walpole into the declaration of war. The people it was who first urged the American war and at last decried it when it became unfortunate. The people it was who encouraged the war with France which saved this country from all the miseries entailed on that. Now again, it's important to remember that in those days, most British people did in fact have very little education, most were illiterate, and most were inevitably prey to rumours and sudden passionate enthusiasms, particularly jingoistic outbursts against France. And so Canning could foresee that if more of the people were involved in politics, the ability of Parliament to exercise a restraining hand would be reduced. He also feared that parliamentary wisdom would decline if it was too representative. He says, The House of Commons owes to the people a manly but not a servile obedience. They should be respectful but not enslaved. They should not watch the eye or bend to the nod, nor crouch to the unspoken will of the multitude, but proceed in the plain path of undeviating independence. They should act to the people as representatives, just as they should act towards their creator as men, virtuously but freely, founding their hopes of retribution on their consciousness of honesty. When he says retribution there, he doesn't mean vengeance, he means the hope of a, a place in heaven. In other words, they, they, what they ought not to be is direct representatives. This is a point we've heard recurrently already in the course from other conservatives. Walter Scott, who was very much opposed to parliamentary reform, added that the most democratic constituencies in Britain, such as Westminster, the, the heart of the political nation, were the scenes of the most disgraceful excesses on election days. It was in the most democratic places that there were riots and drunkenness and bribery of the electors. Scott wrote, Nothing can be conceived more immoral, more unfair, more brutally disgusting than the manner in which the grave and momentous exercise of the elective franchise is there exercised. Let those who saw the hustings at the last contest contradict me if they can. An enlargement of the elective privilege, which should bring the fickle, unthinking and brutal mob into the field, would be a measure which must speedily terminate in military despotism.
to which men have fled in all ages and countries as an evil whose terrors were incalculably less than those of a factious and furious democracy. In other words, if we have too much democracy, uh, it's going to be so chaotic that the people will turn to a military strongman instead. And of course, they've got vividly before their ideas, the, before their eyes, the, the vision of Napoleon. Now, when the Duke of Wellington, the Prime Minister, expressed his complete confidence in the old political system in 1830, the public outcry against him was so great that he was forced to resign as Prime Minister because by 1830 there was nationwide pressure in favour of the idea of parliamentary reform. If you've read George Eliot's wonderful novel Middlemarch, uh, written in 1872 but commemorating what happened in the 1830s, she gives a lo lovely depiction of the way in which in this provincial town, Middlemarch, the agitation for political reform is growing more and more intense and ordinary citizens are becoming more and more agitated about political questions. This is what the Duke of Wellington said which got him into trouble and he's being reported in the third person by Hansard, which is the official parliamentary record. Wellington said, he had never read or heard of any measure up to the present moment which could in any degree satisfy his mind that the state of the representation could be improved or be rendered more satisfactory to the country at large than at the present moment. He was fully convinced that the country possessed at the present moment a legislature which answered all the good purposes of legislation and this to a, de a greater degree than any legislature ever had answered in any country whatever. Well, a, a declaration of absolute complacency there from the Duke of, of Wellington. David Robinson, another parliamentarian, supported the Duke's views and noted that the most turbulent and immoral members of Parliament were those whose elections were the most democratic. This is making a very similar point to that made by Walter Scott. Uh, Robinson said, in respect of knowledge and ability, they rank as low as the slaves of the boroughmonger. Such members stand in the lowest rank in respect of independence. The most violent party men, those who are most insensible to restraint and shame in sacrificing the empire to party and faction, are always to be found among them. With regard to creed, such members occupy the very lowest place in Parliament. We must look to them to find the wild enthusiast, the profligate disturber, the godless revolutionist, the reformer who seeks to, who seeks to sweep away the institutions of the country without sparing its religion, and the projector whose schemes contemplate the dissolution of society. If the House of Commons were composed wholly or principally of such men as those generally are, whose election lies solely with the democracy, the empire would be scourged with an inconceivable evil. So you can see here, there's a passionate intensity, intensity to these conservatives' fears that democracy is going to be ruinous. Well, now, the Whigs, who'd been out, out in the cold politically, really almost without interruption since the 1790s, finally had a chance to govern in the early 1830s, and they were very eager to change the rules, especially since a rising popular clamour in the British provinces supported them. The Reform Bill, as introduced under the Whig leader, Lord Grey, proposed to give seats to the new industrial towns and to take them away from about 140 of the rotten boroughs, these places which no longer had a significant electorate. The rapid spread of industrialisation since the 1780s, particularly in the counties of Lancashire and Yorkshire, which were the centres of the textile industry, the rise of coal mining, particularly in South Wales and the North East, the, the first generation of railway building in the 1830s, the rising iron and steel industries. Uh, in all these ways, uh, these industries, as they were being represented by a new industrial middle class, felt themselves excluded by a political system which heavily favoured the landowners and the aristocracy. Well, Lord Grey's first attempt to pass the Reform Bill through Parliament failed. A new, general, a new general election was held, and I need to emphasise here that whereas in America, ever since the Constitution, there's been a regular timetable for elections, uh, for seats in, in the House every two years, for a presidency every four years, and for the Senate every six years, in Britain there's no necessary timetable. Eventually an election must be held, but they can be held more frequently. And Britain held elections in 1830 and 31 and 32, as repeatedly Parliament stalled on the question of reform. Gray won a large Whig majority in the election of 1831, which he saw as a, mandate, a mandate to go ahead with the reform, and he reintroduced the bill. Now, the people who were opposed to it began using the word conservative 
um, self-consciously about themselves for the first time at this point. Until then, the word Tory had been far more common. But now we start, using, we start seeing the word conservative in the literature of the opponents of reform. Apart from anything else, it was less negative uh, than simply using the term anti-reform. And in the quarterly review in January 1830, the word began to be used and it caught on very, very quickly. The word Tory had always had negative connotations in America and to some extent in, in Britain too because it sounded a little bit like a clique of the old aristocracy and the country gentlemen, rather than potentially the, uh, a, a responsible political posture. Now, passage of the bill, the reform bill, through the House of Commons, presented a painful dilemma to the conservative-dominated House of Lords. The Lords were, knew that if they voted against reform, it would make them very unpopular around the country. But on the other hand, if they voted in favour of it, they'd be undermining their own position. So many of the Lords actually went away from Parliament to avoid having to vote at all. The Anglican bishops, the heads of the Church of England, voted solidly against it. And sure enough, the rejection by, of the legislation by the House of Lords set off a wave of riots throughout England. In my own hometown of Derby, a mob burned down the jail and released all the prisoners. Public buildings in the city of Bristol were looted and burned. And most shockingly of all, even the house of the Duke of Wellington, the great national hero, the victor of the Battle of Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington's house had its windows smashed because he represented the Tory lords. Lord Grey resigned in protest when King William IV refused to swamp the House of Lords. Let me explain what I mean by that. It was the King's prerogative to make new, to, to ennoble people, to give them titles. And the Prime Minister, Lord Grey, said, So long as the House of Lords refuses to uh, approve of the Reform Act, I want you to make new people into Lords until they are a majority, at which point they will pass the legislation. Uh, that is, to uh, flood the House of Lords with new Lords. Now, of course, if you held a, a noble title, that was also a horrifying prospect. Because what it meant was that there were going to be far more Lords in Britain than ever before, most of them upstarts, and the quality of your noble title itself would be diluted. This is one of the things which finally persuaded some of the Lords to change their minds. Anyway, widespread popular protests led Conservatives to fear an outbreak of revolution. There was already rioting in the, in, the, in the provinces. Some petitions from radical reformers called for the abolition of the monarchy and the aristocracy. And so finally, the king, reluctantly recalling Grey as his prime minister, assented to the proposal of swamping the House of Lords with new members. His letter to the Tory Lords finally persuaded them not to oppose the reform any further. And in the end, rather than accept, rather than accept uh, hundreds of new members among their ranks, they held their noses and voted for the reform. And it became law in June of 1832. Well, it certainly didn't have the effect of turning Britain into a democracy. From our vantage point, the reform doesn't seem all that impressive. The vast majority of the members of Parliament were still landed gentlemen, just as they had been before. They were still unpaid. And that meant that you had to have a private fortune of your own before you could possibly hope to be a member of Parliament. And still only a very, very small, a small percentage of the men of England, probably less than 20%, were, in, were, were politically active, were involved in, in uh, creating members of Parliament. There was still no secret ballot. Lord John Russell, when he heard about the possibility of a secret ballot, said, what pitiful figures we should cut, sneaking up to the ballot box, looking with fear to the right and to the left, and dropping in our paper, the contents of which we are afraid or ashamed to acknowledge. Now there again, you see, we're so familiar with the secret ballot, we forget that it's, it was once controversial, and that from Russell's point of view, it seemed absolutely shameful to vote in such a way that you weren't making public who it was you were voting for. That wasn't to come in until quite a lot later. But uh, despite its limitations, the first Reform Act, the Great Reform Act, as it's remembered, was a very, very important moment in British political history because it established the principle of peaceful reform. And that was a very important thing, especially by contrast with what had been happening in France. There'd been the Great Revolution in the 1780s and 90s, then the Restoration in 1815, and then another revolution in 1830. French history from 1789 right up to 1900 was punctuated by revolutions and, and national violence.
Whereas British political history in the 19th century was punctuated by peaceful reform acts, always contested, but always ultimately procedural and peaceful.